Hello, I'm Mally Schansfeld, Managing Editor of Orthodontic Practice US, a Medmark publication. Welcome to a continuing education presentation and question and answer with Dr. Hassam Brahimi. In our webinar today, we will be discussing how independent tooth movement can provide the control and clinical excellence that orthodontists expect and the aesthetic treatment that patients want. Before we get started, I'd like to invite viewers to use the chat box on the right side of your screen to ask any questions, and your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Also, associated with this presentation is a free CE quiz. Within 30 minutes after the end of the webinar, we will email all attendees the presentation replay along with instructions on how to access the CE quiz. Now I'm pleased to introduce our guest for today. Dr. Hassam Rahimi is a diplomate of the American Board of Orthodontics who received his orthodontic certificate in addition to a doctorate in oral biology from Harvard University in 2011. He also received his MBA degree from the University of Texas at Dallas, where he currently owns and operates two private practices limited to orthodontics. Currently, he's a clinical advisor for Brias Technologies with no financial interest and has started more than 300 Brias cases thus far. Dr. Rahimi, we turn the webinar over to you to learn more about our topic for today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Hassan. Today I'm going to talk about independent tooth movement and the technology, um, various technology that's based upon. Independent tooth movement is a concept developed by my dear friend, Dr. Mehdi Pekar. Dr. Pekar is a um, orthodontist and also has a PhD in physics and where this is where this uh, concept um, um, was, this is how this concept was developed. You can see him on the left side of the display filming the movement of teeth um, that are, is essentially also visible on the right side. Um, this is the first prototype of the technology um, that was uh, essentially these teeth are inside a wax diapodont that have been subjected to hot water bath. And then the appliance um, is moving them without any manipula external manipulation um, towards the final predetermined position. What we know about this technology is that it's, uh, one, it's all made out of nickel titanium, it's nitide. And also um, it, um, it's very light force. The question to be asked is, can we move teeth with light forces? And the answer is yes. We have been doing this since uh, the, uh, the beginning of orthodontics. Whenever we were dealing with a rotated tooth, our uh, wire of choice was always a light nitide wire. But the problem was that we couldn't um, correct tooth positions where we came to other forms of tooth movement, such as correcting the tort. For, to correct the tort, we always needed to generate the heavy forces um, because the distance between the point of force application and the center of resistance of the tooth was so small, or because the interbracket distance was so small that it didn't let us generate four, um, heavy moments in order to correct the torque on the tooth. So what we had to do was we had to, we have to use um, heavy forces in order to be able to generate uh, large moments. But what if we increase that interbracket distance significantly, hypothetically? What if we put a bracket side, sideways, hypothetically? In this scenario, are we able to correct the torque on a tooth with light forces? Um, the answer is yes. We have been doing this whenever we had our intrusion arches. Um, and the way we did it was essentially by increasing the interbracket distance. For example, we would skip the premolars, and then we, with a gable bend, we were able to distally tip a molar and also correct the um, torque uh, issues on the front teeth. So um, BRIA system, which is, or independent tooth movement is essentially a replication of this scenario. What we're doing with it is we're extending that interbracket distance significantly. And then also we are eliminating the limi limitations of a straight wire um, that connects one tooth to the next. Um, we, we ran an experiment using the, the orthodontic simulator device. Uh, we uh, created certain scenar different scenarios on the teeth. Basically, what we did was we moved one tooth from, e from the arch, and then uh, that arch was either connected to an 016 lingual nitide wire uh, that has a mushroom shape, 
or a BRIA system. And then we compared the force values and the moment values between the, uh, that was generated in the subject tooth and all the other teeth in the arch. We made a comparison between the two groups. So what you're seeing on this slide, um, the red is the straight NITI wire, and then the blue is the BRIA system. This experiment told us two important things. <clears throat> One, uh, when we look at the data, we notice that the forces generated on the subject teeth, the teeth that were moved, were much lower with the BRIA system. And also we noticed that comparing to the uh, uh, 016 NITI wire, and also we noticed that um, unlike NITI wires, uh, that the teeth right next to the tooth that's being moved basically feel the majority of the force with BRIA that reactive force is being felt by the entire dentition, by the rest of the teeth in the arch. And since it's broken to so many small values, it's not clinically significant. So each one of those individual teeth don't feel much force. And then we have the same um, distribution um, in, of forces. We also have it in the moments as well. Whenever we look at the moments, Brias generates, uh, the moment values are much less on the subject to with Brias comparing to conventional wires, and then the reactive forces of the movement is felt by the entire dentition comparing to the teeth right next to the tooth that's being moved. In other words, whenever you're dealing with conventional orthodontics, the teeth right next to the tooth that are being moved uh, feel uh, the majority of the reactive forces. And then as we, the distance increases, so the forces drop significantly. Whereas with Brias, one, uh, for to achieve the same amount of movement, we are going to need much less forces. And second, the reactive forces are now distributed into the entire arch. Basically, um, what this means is the anchorage unit for every single tooth that's being moved is the rest of the teeth in the arch. That's why um, we, call, we consider independent movers different from traditional braces and aligners because the force uh, profile and the moment profile of it is completely different uh, with those systems. Dependent movers allow us to clinically uh, in, move the teeth independently. It's, we know that it's a low force system. And then we know that because each tooth has its own agenda in, the, um, in this appliance, um, it's the one stage treatment. So each individual tooth is going to rotate and tip and torque and move towards the final destination that was determined by us, independent of the teeth next to it. And that makes the treatment very efficient. The next question to be asked is, is independent tooth movement tooth friendly? I mean, are, whenever we move these teeth like individual of each other, are we going to see any kind of side effects? And we've uh, evaluated this um, by different aspects. We've compared um, root resorption between the BRIA system and the conventional orthodontics. We've compared white spot presence, oral hygiene, um, bone loss, you know, all the different aspects that could determine whether a system is tooth friendly or not, or whether we have round tripping with BRIA or not. And we've noticed that um, in on every category, um, the independent mover of BRIA system stands up. I, performs better. So we did a study using CVCT data and comparing um, the um, root resorption, external root resorption between the BRIAS group and the conventional orthodontics group. These are all my patients randomly sampled. And then we noticed that the BRIAS group is significantly, significantly shows less root resorption. Um, technically speaking, uh, from the samples that we had, 20 from each group, uh, there, we only saw 98% um, of cases that had BRIAS showed either none or mild amount of root resorption comparing to traditional braces that the mild level was about 80%. Um, BRIAS or independent movers basically have an advantage um, comparing to other forms of tooth movement, and that is that they completely eliminate route tripping. So for example, if a tooth has, um, is the, uh, as you can see in this slide, if a tooth is planned to um, move buccally, the metal tooth is planned to move buccally, as you can see, uh, with conventional straight wire systems, 
uh, we, it's inevitable that the teeth right next to it are going to move lingual. Now, if our plan is to keep those teeth on the side exactly where they are and only move the tooth in the middle uh, towards the buccal, uh, that almost never happens. Whereas with the BRIA system or with independent movers, the middle tooth is going to keep moving, feel the force towards the buckle, and it's going to stop um, until that space is created for it without any ramifications on the teeth right next to it. So basically, you never see the other teeth move lingual when a center tooth wants to move buckle. Um, and we do see that in cases one after the other, over and over again. In this example on the display, the tooth on the, the central incisor on the left of the side of the patient stays still while the right one is derotating. If this was straight wire system, the left one should have moved buckle, but as we can see in this side-by-side um, -side comparison, that doesn't happen with the BRIA system. BRIA system can be um, put on the buckle, but mainly speaking, we're using it on the lingual side. So for obvious reasons, there's no white spots. Um, noticeable whenever the case a patient finishes the treatment. It's like you start moving the you move the patient and you move the teeth, you finish the case and get them all straight. And at the end of the treatment, it's as if no appliance was put on the tooth. Whereas with braces, we might see like white spots. We might see some sort of root resorption. We might see some sort of bone loss. We don't see that with uh, these technologies. Um, one of benefit, one big plus on independent tooth movement is that since each tooth is has is separate, it has its own arm. Um, it's totally flossable. So that also for those kind of group of patients that do floss, this is a big 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 plus. Uh, but the biggest the biggest benefit of the independent tooth movement is that since we are not limited by stages of uh, moving teeth, we're not limited by patient compliance, um, all of these adds to a significant amount of efficiency in our treatment. That um, it's up to the date after 300 patients is still surprising to me. In this case on the display, um, you can see that um, a lower incisor was extracted and in a matter of 10 months, we were able to finish the case. Um, that's all because every single one of those teeth um, didn't have to go through the stages of the rotation alignment and you know sagittal correction and space closure. Basically, what BRIUS does, or what these technologies can do, is that they mix them all together. So our leveling alignment and space closure and sagittal correction and finishing all become one continuous, one continuous um, basically flow. Um, so yeah, this is what BRIUS system is. BRIUS system is uh, essentially a one-piece NITI system, a full titanium system, that is designed um, accurately by um, using finite element analysis, which is essentially math. And then it's nothing but a series of arms that each one of them is designed to move the tooth, each individual tooth, to its final position using the shortest possible path. And um, it's composed of three components. It has brackets that are bonded behind the teeth. It has an anchorage base that, that dissipates the force and it has the nitai arms that do the actual movements and express the tip and torque in position and rotation of the teeth. Um, the brackets are nothing but a handle on the tooth. So there's slots of the brackets, they never get used. It's essentially, um, if, you, if we could reproducibly bond a bracket, bond an arm to the tooth, we really could eliminate the need of brackets. But what they do is um, in the BRIA system, they're custom made now and they adapt uh, to the backside of the teeth. And what they do is they only work as a handle on the tooth to be able to replicate the simulation. The anchorage base dissipates and isolates the forces, and then it defines the occlusal plane. Also, it allows us to modify the arch form if we want to do expansions or constrictions. Um, a lot of it comes from that anchorage base if it is, uh, by design. And then also it gives us enough stability to be able to manipulate the sagittal dimension from the beginning of the treatment. That's a big plus. So whenever, if you want to introduce rubber bands, we don't have to wait. We can do it on day one when patient's compliance is maximum. Or if you want to displace with TADS, we can just do it right at the beginning of the treatment. 
The night eye arms is where um, basically they're designed to express the rotation tip and torque of the teeth. They also translate the tooth to their final position. And then they're only they're designed and selected using fine element analysis or math. Um, the level of customization that we get with Briest is technically the next level. It, we can define the forces and moments on every single tooth separately. This level of control was ne we never had it before. Um, aligners, for example, we consider them fully customized, but essentially the same thickness of, of um, plastic is used to all the teeth. So the forces are within the same level, whereas with Brias, we can one tooth to the next, we can completely change the, change the force values and moment values based on our need. For example, if a tooth has bone loss or has root absorption already before we start, we can, all we have to do is tell the company or the technician that that one tooth, I want the forces less, they're gonna give us a brief that expresses much, much less force on that one individual tooth. Um, Brias allows for um, 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 basically adjusts itself based to physiology. By that, I mean, what we know is that each individual tooth when subjected to the Brias appliance is going to feel the right force and moment to take that tooth to work and push it towards basically or pull it towards the right direction. Um, it never goes the wrong way, but the rate of tooth movement is something that biology uh, plays a big part in it. So, for example, as, which can be different from patient to patient and person to person, and I mean, uh, tooth to tooth. In this case, um, as you can see on the display, um, the same distance was, a, was um, being treated on the left and right side of the patient. The same tooth sizes were eliminated from the equation, and then the rate of tooth movement was much faster on the right side comparing to the left side. Um, this doesn't change anything. We know that all those teeth are feeling the forces in the right direction. So all we have to do is wait. And at some point, the left side will catch up. The previous process is very similar to other forms of digital platforms. Um, it all starts with a scan. Uh, the more complicated the case, the more we need uh, a CBCT scan because this system um, has the ability to integrate the CBCT or the cone beam CT data, the 3D X-ray. And uh, I, especially if you're thinking about treating extraction cases or more complicated cases, I strongly encourage you to submit the CBCT. Without it, they were still able to, um, you're still able to treat cases, but the level of customization that you get with in presence of a CBCT scan is, um, is different. Um, you basically, the, the, the software is able to calculate for root volume and bone and you know, the PDL and um, customize the center of resistance of that body. And you know, the level of customization is way, way much more, much more sophisticated and more accurate. The system also has an artificial intelligence integrated into it. If you when we define the age of the patient, the sex, the ethnicity, it, the data or the forces and moments get customized according to that, the needs of that specific patient as much as possible. And then this is very interesting and unique about it. Um, so when we submit all the data, we also submit the uh, photos and uh, we also tell the, you know, the technicians what our treatment plan is in general outlines and what they do is they give us a simulation which we can modify ourselves. And at the same time, we can go ahead and um, tell the technician to do it just similar to aligner, Invisalign or other forms of aligners. And the company gives us, uh, sends us back in a matter of days, um, a Brias appliance and also the brackets that are embedded into a digitally bonded tray. The bonding tray is going to be, going to be used as a jig to uh, basically position the brackets accurately behind the teeth according to the simulation. The layout of the uh, portal is very simple. You basically introduce, uh, define the patient, send a scan or a PDS impression. Um, you define your treatment, if, whether you want to extract or not extract, what kind of anchorage preparations you have in mind. How do you want to move the teeth? You submit the photos, the x-rays, and then if you have the CBCT data, they're able to get the DICOM files and incorporate it into, into the um, simulation. The simulation, when you get it back, 
is uh, pretty much similar to other forms, except it has some uh, forms of uh, digital platforms, except it, if you have a CBCT data again, you can see the bone, you can see the roots, you can see the airways, you can even see the soft tissue, the gums. You can, um, you know, um, go in above and beyond um, what you are used to or accustomed to when it comes to um, treatment planning the case. Um, again, I mean, there was up until I started using Brias, it was never, I never had the ability to look at a dentition upside down and uh, make sure all the roots are lined up. What's the relationship of the bone at the basal bone or the alveolar bone with the roots? What happens if I move those teeth across and, you know, all this? So it, it does give you the next level ability to treatment plan the cases properly. There are certain clinical advantages when it comes to this platform. For example, um, if a tooth is not readily accessible, the surface is uh, limited on a tooth, you're not limited to where we want to position the bracket. The we can position the bracket any way we like as long as we replicate the simulation, the digital simulation. So for example, in this case, as you can see, the brackets on the canines are 90 degrees rotated or completely horizontal. And then as long as we can create the same clinical, uh, the same orientation inside the patient's mouth, then we're good to go and we're able to achieve the results that we want. The position of the bracket on the tooth doesn't, is irrelevant as long as, again, we can replicate the um, digital situation, the digital simulation. In this case, as you can see, the bracket is completely off to the distal side of the tooth, but we're still able to do rotate the canine the way we have planned, which is amazing. Um, teeth, each tooth has its own separate arm, uh, aside from flossing, that also makes uh, doing IPR very easy, so um, or interproximal reduction and very easy. So what we do is we don't have to take the appliance out to do any of this stuff. So whereas with uh, straight wire systems, we do have to take the wire out to do our IPRs. Um, if something breaks, we don't have to take the appliance out. All we have to do is move the arm apart away and uh, use the original digital bonding tray, cut it out, and use that piece, uh, the piece related to the tooth, as a jig to replace the bracket as we planned. Again, due to presence of the um, anchorage base, it is we are able to introduce rubber bands or elastics from the beginning of the treatment, and that's when the patient's compliance is maximum. And then that allows us to, as we are correcting the rotations and tips and torques of the teeth, also attack the sagittal problems that the patients have right from the beginning. And that's going to make the treatments even even more efficient. In this case, that you can see on display. Um, the patient started wearing rubber bands immediately, and that allows us to achieve a class one canine in a matter of six months while the patient is almost ready to be debonded. Um, whenever it comes to when it comes to extractions, the extractions can be done after placing the um, the appliance, and there's no limitation in doing that. Um, I've done it both ways, right before bonding, the patient would remove the teeth, and then we do the bonding or the place the brias in the, into place, and then the patient goes ahead and gets the extractions done. Um, the general dentists are able to work their way around it, and the, the appliance doesn't have to be removed for that, which adds another layer of efficiency. Um, brias don't think of it as a lingual system, because take, the way I think about it is as a multipotential, very versatile, basically, platform that allows me to um, translate my clinical imagination into reality. So for example, in this case, um, this canine was totally out of reach and the plan was to extract the premolars and basically bring the canine down. And because the canine was not accessible from the lingual side, we ended up designing a buckle segment to bring the canine down and make it accessible. And then with the next breeze, um, basically create a class one canine situation. Um, Again, the sky is the limit when it comes to this kind of system. I quite often get asked uh, get asked the question of uh, who do you offer Brias to and who you don't, and my answer is I honestly don't have any uh, clinical uh, reasons not to offer it. I mean, I have in this system, uh, you know, between me and all the other orthodontists that are using it right now. It's, the number is more than 100 at this point across the United States. 
Um, they, we've been using them on cross bite cases, canine impaction, surgical, deep bite, um, open bite, crowding, extraction, non-extraction. All sorts of scenarios are a possibility. As if you can treat them with regular basins, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to treat it with Prius. But if you're starting, um, you might want to take it easy because there is a learning curve. So don't start with the most complicated cases. Don't think that Brius is going to magically do any kind of magic. It just gives you the efficiency, which is an um, exceptional service to your patient. When you're studying, there is a learning curve. The learning curve is both with working with uh, you know, the bonding, the engagement of the appliance, and also most importantly, there is a learning curve to treatment plan. There's a learning curve to look at how to look at these cases when it comes to um, moving the teeth because suddenly now we have this platform that uh, we, we haven't been used to before. I mean, I, I look at myself and the way I treatment plan cases now compared to a year ago is definitely completely different. So when you're starting, you want to start with teenagers because they're easier to handle. I mean, this goes both by for clinical reasons and also in reasons for patient management. These are all the stuff that you have to kind of learn as you start uh, incorporating this into your practice. You wanna start with teenagers that have moderate crowding. That's crowding between four to seven millimeters. They have deep bites or expand, they need expansion or they have spacing um, or you know they need some sort of sagittal correction or they have midline issues. These are cases that respond very well. You don't wanna start with too easy because the too easy cases, the problem is if you have a slight error in your bonding or um, you know, then you will see that error when the, into patient's mouth and then it's gonna be very disappointing. Um, now I'm going to, since time is a little limited, I'm going to go ahead and show you a few cases and step-by-step -step progress. And at the end, I will, we will have some questions and answers as you find it. So the first case I'm going to um, introduce and discuss with you is a non-extraction case, not a complicated case, but the patient is missing both upper lateral incisors, that upper right, um, lateral is a primary lateral that has almost no root left. The plan was to um, get the canines into class one, open up the space, coordinate the uh, midlines, and then basically prepare him for future implants for um, a bridge for the meantime. Lateral CEF and the panoramic x-ray is displayed. There's nothing special about the case going on. This is one of my uh, um, first cases that I had treated with the system. So we started, uh, we bonded him in June of 2019. And uh, by July, when he came back, some the canine distillation had already started. The midline was moving towards the center. The lower anterior crowding was getting resolved as time went by. And then um, in three months mark, uh, we can see that this is when I started using the rubber bands to help with the correction of the sagittal dimension. But uh, we can see that the canine is distalized now, um, still has a way to go. In four months, um, uh, the bite blocks were removed. Uh, the canines on the right side were class one and the left side, class one. We still had the, the problem of the spacing in the midline, the diastema. Uh, it was surprising that why it didn't close. So I took an X-ray and I noticed that uh, there's some root divergence going on, but nothing else is blocking the way. So I just gave it a little bit of more time and then in six months mark in November, the mid, this middle space was closed. Um, the case was pretty much ready to get the restorations. But when you look closer, you can see that on the lower incisor area, there's still one tooth that's not behaving. When I went back and compared to the simulation, I noticed that I had a bonding error. The bracket well, had to be repositioned. So I fixed that with the jig. And then in seven months mark, the patient was ready to get debonded. Um, the case looked good. The canine's class one, the midline's on. And then the, I sent the patient to remove the baby tooth and receive a permanent retainer with Pontex. This is an appliance that New, en New England Orthodontic Lab um, makes it and manufactures it for our patients. And they do a great job in delivering. As you can see, 
the patient came back in six months after retainers, everything holds steady, the case looks great, midline on, patient happy, smiling, and then um, pay one year mark after the bond, still everything looks good. And we can also compare the uh, before and after treatment x-rays. Unfortunately, the patient was not fully biting down on the initial x-rays, but still at the final, you can see the roots are healthy, midlines are on, spaces are core, I mean, symmetric, everything looks good. And the final lateral step shows the, um, you know, how good the overjet and overbite and proclination of the teeth are. The second patient I'm going to show you is an extraction patient. Uh, the patient had Invisalign before, came to me as a transfer. She wasn't happy with the protrusion, uh, her profile, the proclination and protrusion of the teeth. So um, we decided to do an extraction treatment for her. The problem was that um, she had an upper right five that was painful and needed a root canal. So instead of four, we decided to keep it symmetric. We decided to do all fives for her. The teeth gets painful before bonding. So this is the lateral CEF. I'm sorry, the panoramic X-ray and nothing special. And we can see the lateral CEF that shows how protrusive and proclined the incisor are. Um, patient came back for bonding. She had already removed the teeth because that uh, lateral, uh, that premolar was painful. The patient was bonded in May of 2019. And then she came back in July, in August, I'm sorry. And we noticed that the spaces are on the top are halfway closed. The bottom is a little bit slower, so, um, but still closing. What, one thing you wanna notice about independent tooth movement is that each tooth has its own agenda. Uh, for example, this patient came with straight lower teeth uh, before the, we just started the treatment. Now suddenly she has crowding in the bottom. That crowding is not as a, as, um, um, a sign of round tripping. That crowding is caused by the fact that all these teeth are moving towards their final destination, which is much more upright than what they were originally. But some move faster and some move slower. This is one of the things you have to discuss with your patients when you start the case. Because um, if you have a good, good level of alignment at the beginning, uh, you either request that to maybe maintain during uh, the treatment planning se session, or otherwise you should expect that initial perfect alignment to be disrupted for a short term until the teeth basically reach their final destination. That's, that's always a possibility. But this crowding, even the tooth, the lower right ladder in central, in, lower left central incisor that appears to be buckled uh, comparing to the rest of the teeth, even that one has moved lingual a little bit when you compare it to the previous session. Um, so basically there is no round tripping, but a tooth just like that will stop moving until the space for it is available, and then it will continue to move towards <clears throat> a much more upright position. This is four months progress. The spaces are closing, and the crowding in the front is appearing much less and less. This is six months progress, seven months, and spaces are closing properly. I'm adding attachments to control the vertical, control the sagittal as a fine fit. The goal is to achieve the most efficient treatment as possible, whatever helps um, to make the treatment efficiency improve. Um, there's no problem with doing that. One of the benefits of this system is that you can run any kind of elastics as you want and take advantage of that fact right from the beginning of the treatment. In 11 months, the spaces are almost closed. In 14 months, um, technically speaking, uh, we're almost done with the treatment, still a little bit of uh, spaces to close. But in 16 months, um, the gaps are closed. At this point, um, I subjected the patient to refiners, which is basically the aligners that the company develops. Now, there's an explanation to be given here. For example, <clears throat> you see that molar on the upper right side is a little bit tipped. Um, this was this used to happen a lot with the original versions of the uh, the brackets. The these brackets were speed brackets from that they have been discontinued for the past year or two. But this uh, the speed brackets had some play with the arm, so it allowed uh, these kind of tippings to happen at the time for extraction cases. But that problem has been resolved by uh, switching to custom brackets that the company makes. 
Um, but what I want to show you is that in a span of from September of 2020 to October of 2020, span of about four or five weeks, uh, technically four or five um, aligners, I was able to settle that molder by um, a series of aligners. And how does that happen? So one thing I have found out and uh, is that we don't have any bone loss. We don't have any root resorption. Everything looks fine. There's no white spots. But the teeth at the end of the treatment, uh, they're just, they respond better to uh, any kind of movement at the end. They're more malleable per se. That, um, so if, when it comes to the end of the treatment, there's three scenarios possible. One scenario is that everything looks perfect. So you basically, all you do is you scan your, your for your final retainers. The second scenario is that everything is perfect, but, but that one tooth, or one, that little space. Um, then one thing you can do is you can remove uh, the appliance, leave the brackets on, and then go ahead and manufacture a series of aligners. One, two, three. Usually if you can get it with, let's say an Invisalign or other form of uh, commercially available aligners in like 10, uh, with, at the end of a Brias treatment, you should be able to achieve the same result with about two or three um, refiners that the company makes. Why? One, teeth are more malleable. Um, I'm thinking that probably the PDL is more stretched all around. And also it's only a hypothesis, hasn't been tested or evaluated. But, but the second thing is, uh, the reason is we have these attachments behind the teeth that work like a charm. They are huge. They give us a good mechanical advantage that allows us to do the movements that we need. So this patient at the end of the treatment, um, the midlines are on, the protrusion is much less. We were able to, and proclination, we were able to re 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 reduce protrusion by about 15 degrees and move teeth back by about four to three to four millimeters, which is significant, as you can see in this uh, superimposition. So, um, so your progress of the teeth shows initial, and you can see the protrusion, protrusion, you can see the progress. This is halfway into the treatment, and then you can see the final. This patient was treated with two briases. Patient came back six months after debond, and at that point, we um, um, patient everything was holding steady, and everything looked great. The next patient that I'm going to show you is another. Um, it's an adult patient, 34 year old. Um, who presented with a chief complaint of, I don't like my overbite, she, he meant over jet, and also he didn't like his crowding at the bottom. After careful examination and running through the simulation, we ran both scenarios of extracting four teeth versus one tooth. And then it, the simulation showed that it is possible to achieve proper over jet overbite and um, sagittal relationship with extracting one lower incisor. So you can see the severity of origin in this, in this lateral set. And you can see that um, there's a significant amount of curve of speed in the lower arch. The patient was bonded in March of 2021. Uh, because that lower canine on the right side was not accessible from the lingual side at the beginning, um, I went ahead and requested a buckle segment to um, save us some treatment time by derotating the canine while the extraction of the lower incisor, while those other teeth are moving towards the extraction state. And that worked like a charm. So on May, <clears throat> and you can see the progress. The patient just had just removed the tooth. This is six weeks into the treatment. And then in uh, June, you can see this extraction space is almost, I mean, down to about a million, less than two millimeters. One thing to note is how well the bone architecture is maintaining that area. Um, that's one of the benefits of using light continuous forces. The teeth are very, very bone friendly, gum friendly, tooth friendly uh, when, it, when they're subjected to this, these levels of forces and you know, uh, the continuity of the force, which is in contrast to other forms, like um, uh, other forms of tooth movement. Um, five months into treatment, the space is almost closed. So we got some work to do. The upper crowding was resolved since the first month into the treatment, but I'm still holding them uh, for the sake of the sagittal dimension and vertical dimension. At the same time, um, the bottoms are lining up, still have some curve of speed. 
left into the system and some residual spaces that uh, uh, requires me to keep going. In uh, seven months, uh, the second Brius was delivered to finish the case. Don't uh, please note that uh, Cinco Brius, um, the nighttime nature of the appliance allows it to actively work in majority of cases up until like about six to seven months. Then it would slow down. So at that point, you either done with the treatment or you still have some have some way to go. If you still have some way to go, you have to decide to do it with uh, aligners, which is you know it's going to be more efficient than regular aligners, or you've got to request a second brief. With my extraction cases, usually I need a second brief to do all the detailing. In this case also, that's what we did. So the space on the bottom at this point is almost closed. Eight months into the treatment, the canines are class one, lower arches pretty much getting there, the uppers are lining up, and then in nine months, uh, everything's still progressing the way I want to. And then in 10 months, this is when I decided to scan uh, for uh, the final aligners to do all the detailing. Um, this was in January, so technically a total treatment time of 10 months. You can look at the lower incisor gums, uh, gingival tissue. You can see how well that side has healed as if it never had the tooth removed. You can look at the x-rays. You can look at the bone levels. Everything is uh, like screaming uh, harmony and perfection. And um, You can check the overjet and overbite also on the left uh, side, the lateral step. You can see how well you were able to fix this patient's bite with the least amount of discomfort and this least amount of um, showing and damage to the teeth and the tissues. So this is the day of <clears throat> retention. This is after the, those uh, couple of aligners were used. Uh, you can see that the upper midline is coincident with the center of the lower incisor. The lowers are pretty much straight, up, straight and everything looks good and perfect. The small arc, everything is ideal. And then the lateral self of the final, you can also see that. Just take a look at the degree that lower curve of speed was flattened in this X-ray. It just tells you volumes about how efficient this system is in, when it comes to these kind of problems. And then you can also here see how to what degree we were able to fix the overjet and overbite. Amazing. Um, so this is the initial and the final side by side. Um, I didn't want to uh, crop out any of these photos because every single one of them speaks volumes about, you know, what this appliance or system enables us to do for our patients. This is what we had in the simulation. Aside from the gum remodeling that the software doesn't have yet, you can see that we technically hit every other goal that we had planned, um, you know. It's a little bit scary, I mean, not scary, but this shows how important that original treatment planning is when it comes to this technology. If you miss something, you're going to see it in the patient's mouth. If I want to be critical, that upper left canine is a little bit more procline comparing to the right one. And then you can see that's in my simulation, unfortunately. And then you can see the exact same thing inside the patient's mouth. Amazing. Another case, and then I'll leave it to questions and answers. Um, so this patient is a teenage, a 12 year old, well, 12 year and five month old female that had a unilateral class two going on. Lower arch was pretty much okay, just some minor crowding, but the upper had some crowding and then the canines were class two on the left side. The right canines were class one, like a perfect class one. So what we decided to do since the upper midline was off was to do a unilateral premolar extraction in this case. You can see the level of overjet. You can see the asymmetry <clears throat> in these x-rays. That was not a skeletal, but purely dental. So what we did in this case was uh, basically the tre treatment plan for an extraction of upper left first premolar. Uh, and then the patient uh, received Brius in October of 2020. And uh, in November, she came back. She had not yet extracted the premolar. So when she came back in December, she had the tooth removed just a, a week ago or a couple of weeks ago. 
at this point, uh, space closure is starting. As you can see, <clears throat> um, the um, space closure happens very quickly from December to January. Uh, we see that uh, there's only about a millimeter or so space left on that canine. At this point, we introduce rubber bands. Yeah, at this point, we introduce rubber bands to close the spaces. <clears throat> the midline is getting there. Everything looks good. It's, we're only three months into treatment. We still, I have to close the spaces basically. We're still five months into treatment. Um, everything looks symmetric. Uh, midline is coincident, and, uh, but we still have some spaces to close in six months is when I noticed that the loop on the arm is not letting the space to close. So I request for a redesign of the appliance. Also, it was about six months into the treatment. So it was a good time to do that. I scanned again, we remove Brias, you scan it, and then you put it back on because you don't want to lose any remaining activation inside the appliance. And then into seven months, I reinstalled the second Brias. Uh, we keep going. Notice that we, there's no more rubber bands involved because the canine is class one at this point. Um, nine months, 10, 11 months into treatment. And then this is when all is left for me to do is a little bit of hairline spaces to close. Everything else looks good. So at this point, our lower arch is leveled. Everything looks good. So I decide to switch to aligners or refiners. And basically, that's what we do. <clears throat> And then patient comes back next month, and then we debond the case. One thing I want to bring your attention to is that please look at the upper occlusal photo, and then notice that <clears throat> we were able to close that premolar space while we maintained the arch symmetry. Normally speaking, I mean not nor I mean whenever we have some uh, poor man's orthodontics, we always Whenever we do a unilateral extraction, we always have um, the arch form is not symmetric on the extraction side. Usually it collapses a little bit, but here it shows to what degree we are able to maintain the arch form. And basically it's as if we have replicated sliding mechanics, whereas in the Bria system, there is no, there is no sliding. We don't slide, we just move things um, by the arms. Um, these are the D-bond records. On the left side, you can see the um, panoramic X-ray. As you can see, all the roots are parallel. You don't see any signs of root resorption. The canines are a class one. Molars on the right side are class ones, and the left side are full cost class two. Everything looks good. And then when you look at the lateral set, you can see the perfect overjet and overbite, the flattened lower curve of speed. I mean, it screams idealness. So this is side by side of where we started and what we achieved at the end of the treatment. Notice the composition of the white spots that were present from the beginning of the treatment. It's as if we moved everything without, I mean, you know, introducing any kind of harm to the teeth, which is amazing. And then this is what we had simulated and what we had achieved. Again, when you look at those lateral incisors, for example, on the top, even the light shadow on the simulation kind of matches what we have on the actual tooth. It's, it's amazingly accurate. That's all I have for you. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation. If you have any questions for me, please go ahead and uh, I'm ready to answer all your questions and concerns. If you wanna contact me or have any uh, cases to run it by me, I'll be more than happy to help. Um, that's all I have for you. Thank you, Dr. Rahimi. Um, there are some questions coming in, but before I get to those, I'd like to again invite viewers to use the chat box on the right side of your screen to ask any questions that you have. Um, we just have time for a few questions today. Um, first question was, what was the learning curve like as you implemented this new technology into your practice? Well, <clears throat> one of the biggest differences when you start treating this case is I mean, uh, treating with Brias with is that just the platform itself is so versatile and it has so much more into it. And for the most part, it's a little bit, um, as I explained during the presentation too, is um, 
unforgiving. So if you make any mistake during the treatment planning process, you're going to see it in the patient's mouth. So just being able to manage that required a lot of thinking at the beginning about my cases, about basically you have to uh, learn to look at every single tooth and compare the position of that tooth relative to its surrounding environment. And that requires a lot of accuracy. So one of the things I had to do was that I learned that if I don't take serial photographs every time the patient comes in, I'm not able to manage that case properly because <clears throat> with regular braces, there's a lot of trial and error going on. Um, you can always do something and then, um, you know, if it doesn't work, change it or, um, uh, you know, uh, switch to different method of achieving the same goal. With this, um, all of that is time consuming. And since this is a treatment modality that's based on efficiency, you wanna be able to see or address every single aspect of the treatment from the beginning of the treatment. So that made it a little bit more complicated. Um, and it was something that um, at the beginning, I wasn't used to it. I was still, uh, the mind, mindset I had was, oh, okay, I'm gonna do this treatment plan. And then when the time comes, I can then see what happens. And based on that, I would decide the next steps. Whereas the Brias enables you to basically just go straight ahead all the way to the end without having taking away all the guesswork out of it. Um, but our eyes are not trained for that at the beginning. So treatment planning becomes very important. Serial photo photography becomes very important. When you, with regular braces, again, uh, what we do is we, um, we just, you know, observe a process that's happening. But with Brias, we have to observe 28 different processes that's happening at the same time because each individual tooth has its own agenda. So you have to take, be, take the photos and then look at them in clinic uh, side by side in order to be able to see, okay, so is this tooth following the, you know, it's, uh, it's going towards where it's supposed to be. Do I need to do any IPRs? Do I need to add elastics? Do I need to do any kind of modifications or minor modifications to my treatment? It's not possible without, without that. So if somebody's starting, <clears throat> I suggest um, maybe run by your treatment at the beginning by more professional, I mean, more um, experienced uh, colleagues who are doing it right now. And since it's a lot of us at this moment, um, you're not, you will not be short of uh, gaining um, that expertise in, in fine-tuning your treatment plan. The other thing was the importance of CBCT x-rays. I mean, whenever you're dealing with an appliance or a system or a platform that gives you so much, uh, is able to be customized to so, such a like uh, deep level, then you might want to take advantage of that. Without CBCT data, uh, there is some simplification going on, and uh, probably that's not the best solution for a simpler case. Okay, a second question. What's been the most surprising aspect of the system? The biggest thing for me is that the efficiency. Um, to the point that I have put cases online uh, my own clinical cases, um, and then people don't think, they think it's Photoshop or they think uh, it's the dates are made up, I don't know. It's, uh, we get the results and outcomes that um, you don't see with aligners or regular braces, you just don't. It does, the biology of uh, tooth movement is a little bit different with, in this technology. And the fact that in that independent tooth movement, uh, it just makes it so much more efficient that we're not used to it. Um, if we can come over the barriers of bonding and engagement at the beginning, and we find we start with a few ideal cases at the beginning, um, then that's going to be something that will wow everybody who starts it if they have never done it before. It's the efficiency for sure. What, what are the ideal cases to start with this system? Um, again, as uh, I mentioned in presentation, you want them to be teenagers. Why? It's, I mean, the learning curve of this system is not necessarily about um, the clinical aspects of it. It's also the pr practice management aspects of it too. Teenagers uh, don't complain as much as adults do. 
But the problem is when you start with this, uh, with the lingual system essentially, um, then for some reason, everybody thinks it's for adults. Whereas my experience has been that the teenagers, the kids that I introduced the system to, they become raving fans. So if you're looking in like increasing the number of, because they don't feel what an adult feels when it comes to lingual systems. These systems are not necessarily more uncomfortable than other form of lingual systems. It's just that when you just giving, giving it to adults, adults are in general more sensitive to um, lingual systems. Anything small or big bothers them, where a kid, it doesn't bother them. You don't want your cases to be too simple. At the same time, you don't want them to be too complicated. The two complicated uh, treatment plans are for, for obvious reasons because you want to learn to how to treatment plan the cases and you want your staff to be familiar with engagement of the supply um, But two easy cases also, um, the cases that you can treat with like a few aligners, you know, um, those cases have the risk of when, if you start with them, then suddenly you do a bonding and then there's an error in the bonding or, um, um, you know, and that whole fact that the teeth do move independent a little bit, it's going to make the patient experience not favorable because you started with an ideal relationship and suddenly, you know, if one tooth is wrong because the bonding wasn't done properly. So that's another thing to consider. You want to do a cases that are moderate, either moderate crowding or moderate spacing. Brias works wonders in opening up the bite. It does wonders in so flattening the curvo speed, or if you have an open bite, it does wonders in extruding the teeth. Um, if you want to do expansions, this is a very efficient form of expansions. At this point, I'm using it instead of using an uh, RPE or rapid pile load expander, because with a Brias design for phase ones, I can do my palatal expansions and my two by fours all at the same time in one single unit appliance. That's technically expanding like an iPad expander and also aligning my front teeth and fixing that over jet or over bite or cross bite or whatever. So these are the kind of cases that you want to go with. And um, 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 one other thing which is very amazing is how quickly it gets the midline on. Midline is one of those areas that we have a hard time with aligners or with the conventional orthodontics, and we think we're hypothesizing that the reason we can get the midline on so fast is again independent tooth movement because the anchorage for that each individual incisor is the rest of the dentition, including the molars. So that incisor will move across and gives you this whole dimension very effectively. Um, yeah. How many doctors are using this system? Um, that's a question for Bria's company, but. I think we are now more than 100 people across the United States, 100 providers at least. And then uh, if you go to the website, www.bs.com, there's a locator. You can technically, um, if you're interested in joining, well, you can register through there. Uh, the company has reps all across the United States now. There's trainers. There's a lot of good resources that um, you know, is available to um, any orthodontist who wants to start. And the company is rapidly growing. So I think at this point it's more than 100, but somebody from a company can probably provide better information about that. And uh, we only have time for one more question, which is how has this complemented or changed your treatment philosophy? Treatment philosophy, again, I mean, I now find regular orthodontics like Charles Play. <laughs> Because again, right now, uh, after a while, you get used to doing the endpoint with ultimate accuracy when it comes to treatment planning these cases. Uh, just so many details that you look at, uh, the, the torques, the tips of each individual tooth, rotation, the curve of speed, uh, vertical, you know, um, how the teeth are moving through the bone. Um, am I expanding enough? Do I need to expand more? You, you can do all of that when you're thinking about the case right at the beginning of the treatment instead of doing it gradually through a treatment. All you're doing in your follow-up visits is making sure nothing is broken, nothing is bothering the patient. Um, if you have to do any modifications in your anchorage requirements or space management, that's about it. Um, everything else, all the um, 
um, the foundation of your treatment has been already uh, set in stone from the beginning of the <clears throat> of the treatment. I'm not saying that this there's no way to correct a mistake though. For example, if you have made a mistake in your treatment planning, you can always request a refinement. That's why this uh, or a uh, new breeds, for example. I've had a cases that I started my extraction and then I started to switch to extractions and I had to go ahead and submit a new request for a new appliance. Although I don't encourage you to do that, but what I'm trying to say is there is this peace of mind that you know that there's no way um, things can go the wrong way as long as you're careful, but reaching that level of um, paying attention to details and um, uh, anticipating anything, everything, anything and everything that goes with the treatment from the beginning, that's completely new and um, has helped me a lot. Revenue-wise, our office has, has seen jumps significantly. Um, and um, I mean, any aspect that I look at it, it has um, improved our flow in the clinic. And, you know, it has, um, has made a difference, a big difference. Well, thank you everybody for your questions, but we've run out of time today. And if we did not get to your question, we will answer it after the webinar via email. Uh, in the next 30 minutes, we'll send you a link to the replay of this presentation with instructions on how to access the CE quiz. Please be sure to complete the free CE quiz associated with this webinar to receive your continuing education credit. Thank you all again for attending and a special thank you to Dr. Hassam Rahimi and our sponsor for this webinar, Brias Technologies. Thank you and have a great day.